Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, in, in early December, I sent a letter to Secretary Carter um, uh, regarding the process that drone operators, commanders, and ultimately the White House uh, and, uh, used to initiate drone strikes. Specifically, I, I was interested in, and remain interested still in um, uh, certain aspects of the process. According to the U.S. policy standards and procedures for the use of force put out by the White House, the United States will use lethal force only against a target that poses a continuing imminent threat to U.S. persons. Yet media reports uh, uh, based um, off of leaked documents seem to suggest that the amount of time between when a target is identified, uh, the President authorizes the use of lethal force on a target and the ex execution of that strike uh, can take a lot of time, a lot of time that we don't commonly associate with the word imminent. In fact, uh, it, it can take several months. So General Perkins and General Carlisle, um, can, can you confirm the accuracy of these reports about the length of time between the identification of the target and, and the execution of the order? Sir, so I'll uh, discuss it from my experience and how we operate. Um, again, Army unmanned aerial systems are generally organic assets to a tactical formation. And having commanded an infantry division in Iraq where I had these assets, um, it was, as long as I was operating with underneath my rules of engagement, it was somewhat instantaneous. Now, you may be referring to some strategic targets uh, that have different planning parameters of, of which um, I'm not involved in that process, so wouldn't comment. But I'll tell you, at the, at the tactical level, uh, it, it was not an issue once the rules of engagements were established that I had to struggle with. Okay. General Carlin. Yes, sir. Thank you very much for the question. I, I would uh, offer that uh, if, if you would like at some point in the future in a classified uh, environment, we could take this uh, discussion probably to a different level uh, to get more probably to the question you're really asking. But in an open forum, there's some things that we probably shouldn't discuss in here. But uh, having said that, I think there's a couple of things. One is a custody of a potential target and how you do that in time. Again, that would go into the classified piece. And then both the ID uh, and continuous ID as part of that custody, as well as collateral damage estimates and, and how you deal with those. Uh, again, those are things that uh, when you talk about strategic targets and the things you're talking about at a deeper, at a higher classification level, we go into a deeper discussion about what we provide uh, and what the Air Force does in accordance with how we do that. I, I do, I do believe truly that with respect to rules of engagement and rules and laws that we in the United States Air Force follow all of the rules of engagements and follow all of the laws in accordance with the law of armed conflict and uh, the appropriate laws that pertain to that, sir. Okay, thank you. A um, number of members of this committee are concerned about cybersecurity issues uh, across uh, the Department of Defense. Um, as state and non-state actors alike seem to be increasing their threat capability in this area. Um, now, drones rely completely on wireless technology, of course. That's what makes them valuable. It's what enables them to do what they do. Um, uh, the, the use of wireless technology to be connected to their operators in other parts of the world, um, and, and this creates an obvious area of security concern. Can you tell me how the Department of – I'd like to know how is, is the Department of Defense um, working to protect the operational security of unmanned vehicles from crippling cyber attacks and potentially a cyber hacking incident that, that could compromise our security here? Sir, that is a major concern across that whole domain. I'll address it initially with our unmanned aerial systems. Right now, without getting into too many details in this forum, our number one modernization issue, specifically with our shadow and the gray eagles as they come out, is um, encrypting and protecting that communications link, I guess is the best way to say it, and the data protection. And so that is our number one modernization issue right now with our shadows, is, that, is to protect it from the type of threat that you talked about. Uh, yes, sir, Senator. We, again, same thing. We are looking hard at all the different ways, and, and there's there's cyber protection, and there is uh, the way that you make it more difficult for them to get into those nodes via encryption, via directional, via the type of waveform, and the 
capability you're using with respect to directional data links and, and things like that. Um, but there is, a, again, a level, if you would like, in a future environment, we can come and spend time at a classified level talking about the things we're doing for cyber protection. But I think in general for the United States Air Force in particular is we all know that everything almost to, a, to an item that we employ has cyber challenges and vulnerabilities that we have to protect. And we're looking hard at what cyber operations of the future and cyber protection of all systems in the future uh, look like and how we're doing that. And that is one of the big areas that we're moving forward on in the Air Force as part of our cyber defense. Mr. Chairman, uh, I've got one more follow-up with Mr. Uh, General Carlisle, if that's all right. Uh, on January 20th, the Washington Post reported that uh, the Air Force RPA force has been experiencing an increase in electrical and in mechanical failures, um, causing the destruction or sustained damage to 20 large drones last year. This includes um, 10 MQ-9 Reapers, which when fully equipped cost $14 million to replace. So, General, can you tell us what the Air Force is doing to investigate the common causes of these types of accidents and how you're working to make the RPA fleet more sustainable? Yes, sir. Um, the, uh, it's generally been uh, centralized on the starter generator, which is the problem in the MQ-9 uh, community. The new MQ-9s, the Block 5 MQ-9s that we are producing now have a different electrical system, so it does not have the same starter generator, does not have the same problem. With the older Block 1 MQ-9s, uh, the starter generator is a problem. We've We've worked with the, the um, manufacturer. We found some quality control issues. We really not have not found the root cause in that, though. But we we have uh, put in and we are modernizing or we're um, um, modifying the current Block One MQ9s with a thing called ESIP, Electrical uh, Safety Improvement Program. And basically, we put a direct drive brushless alternator that allows 10 hours of flight capability if you lose a starter generator, which has caused those accidents that you referenced, Senator. Uh, so that, is, and just since last April, we have recovered 17 MQ-9s using this direct drive uh, alt brushless alternator. Uh, so, so that gives us a capability with the, old, with the older MQ-9s, the Block 1s. The Block 5s, it's not a factor, sir. Great. Thank you very much. 